Um, what's exciting is, I guess, why we're all here together. Um, and I've just done a really exciting project with the Australian Sports Commission, which is looking at, so that, I don't know if you guys have ever seen, there's a, an amazing suite of resources on the Australian Sports Commission website um, called the Female Performance and Health Initiative. Um, and it was written kind of for athletes. So looking at females in particular and female athletes and trying to help athletes themselves to understand more about their own bodies and their menstrual cycles and how they differ from men. Um, and you guys are probably, well, you guys are certainly working with female athletes. Um, and right now I've come on board to look at all of this stuff through a coaching lens. So how do we, um, you know, how do we help coaches and certainly not just male coaches, um, but, but female coaches, all coaches, be able to create those safe environments with athletes, um, open up conversations, um, you know, just have that environment where things are normalised and not made to be taboo subjects kind of thing. Um, and what I was, yeah, when I was putting this presentation together, I was sort of, I, I think as coaches in a way, sometimes there's a bit of a, um, you know, you, and depending on what, what sort of level, obviously we've got coaches of all different levels, but sometimes I feel like there's almost that expectation that, um, you know, you turn up and you coach an athlete and within that one training session, the athlete should get better and suddenly become a physiologically a different beast or sort of stronger or, uh, yeah, and I don't know if that is actually the case, but I wonder if sometimes coaches almost put that pressure on themselves that an athlete should be almost different when they walk away from the training session, better in some way. Whereas I wonder if, um, you know, what you guys bring to, and I'm gonna call them athletes, regardless of whether they're eight or 80, um, but the, the active community that you're sort of working with is just that community and, and a, you know, a safe environment and a place that they can go to where they feel valued um, and a place that maybe helps build their leadership skills, maybe it helps build their communication skills. Um, you know, what is, because I can't help but think, I, I love this analogy at the moment that sport is a vehicle. You know, sport is the vehicle. It gives us that opportunity in a way to live our best lives. And, and exactly what like what we're all involved in sport for is probably slightly different, but I think in a way the big you know there's a big picture as well, um, and it's just it's it really is heartwarming to see you guys so involved, and especially if I can say a young guy like yourself wanting to be involved in you know with younger people and yourself helping them to, you know, be better versions of themselves and, and coach. I think it's a, yeah, it's a really incredible thing. Um, and so it's nice that we've just got this, yeah, kind of sense of community almost around it. Um, so anyway, I wanted to start off with, um, so yes, so the project that I'm um, sort of about to sink my teeth into is looking at um, the female, sort of the female life cycle almost, but trying to look at it through a coaching lens. So how can we help coaches to open up conversations with the females that they might have around them so that there's not that sort of uncomfortableness um, and I guess realising that I don't think, and the fact that you guys just turn up tonight, you're already all doing amazing things in the people that you're touching, like the communities that you're working with and rubbing shoulders with because you want to learn already have that growth mindset um, and I think that's yeah exactly the type of thing that I'm hoping yeah there's more you know we can have some more conversations about going forward so I have a little um I have a little video that I thought we'd play just to kind of get kick started and um anyway you can tell me what you think after this anyway have a little look at this Very early Friday night, that's a loft run. Well, not a funny looking video. Come here, Brock. Get you, Jerry. What am I, the bubble now? That's 
check. I want to see you do the death crawl on you. I want to see your absolute best. <laughs> what? You want me to go to the 30? I think you go to 50. Okay. I can go to 50 if nobody's on my back. I think you do a Jeremy on your back. But even if you can, I want you to promise me you're going to do your best. All right. Your best. Okay. You're going to give me your best. I'm going to give you my best. Chase National Park, uh, and there's a huge number of um, 
Aboriginal carvings all around the, the national park. And we have a beach house down here, this is Panther Beach. So if you're thinking um, Home and Away, where Home and Away is filmed, Home and Away is just a throw across the ocean that way. And um, this is my little kind of zen place, so it's always my, my acknowledgement to country. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I am, well, I was an Ironman triathlete. Um, I am an open water swimmer now. I tend to, when we're just discussing this, I like to be in the water. You guys like to do things on top of the water. So um, that's, that's the difference that we have, have there. I'm an accredited sports scientist. Uh, so I started um, my sort of sports science journey a long time ago. Um, I did my PhD, so I did my sort of undergraduate uni, and I did my lucky enough to get a scholarship with the Australian Institute of Sport. Um, and uh, it was with uh, Swimming Australia and the University of the Sunshine Coast. So I essentially became the sports scientist for the Australian Paralympic swimming team as well. So I traveled um, the world basically with them and did my PhD at the same time. Um, so I went to two Paralympic Games, uh, Beijing in 2008 and London in 2012. So lucky enough to go to both, and uh, yeah, very, very grateful to have that experience, especially with Paralympic athletes. I don't know if you guys have worked with any Paralympic athletes or athletes with disabilities at all, um, but um, yeah, very, just, yeah, very huge honour to be part of that. Um, and once I submitted my PhD, I got a position at the Western Australian Institute of Sport, so moved over here. Um, and actually, I was looking at some of the photos at the back and recognised um, half the girls and boys. I worked with rowing for, I think, most of my time at WACE. So, I, I full disclosure that I've never sat in a rowing boat. Um, and I, I, I know I'm sure I promised it to many athletes at times who I've asked to do VO2 maxes and all sorts of things. Um, but I do, I've got a fairly good understanding of the, um, certainly not the technical feel of the boat in any way, shape or form, but I, I understand very well the physiology that is required to row. Um, suffice to say that I think you're all mad. <laughs> it's a, um, it would have to rate as one of the most physiologically demanding sports there is. So, huge, huge respect to yourself and all the athletes you work with. Um, now I kind of call myself a, somewhere between an accredited sports scientist and a, an athlete preparation specialist. Um, really, I guess now I'd actually change that title to educator in a way. So I now run my own business, um, it's called Peak Preparation. And um, yeah, I love now taking other people's research. I did my bit of research um, and I now enjoy taking other people's research and distilling that into society, if you like. Um, I guess with this notion of helping to, um, you know, better ourselves in any way, shape or form that we can. So, yeah, I've got a whole suite of sort of sports science um, education modules that I take around WA to athletes in different regions. Um, I do some work in schools, um, with some different sporting clubs. I've got like judo and equestrian and, yeah, a few different sports on the go at the moment, which is fun. And uh, then other little projects are like this, um, with the Australian Sports Commission that I've just started. Um, founder of Peak Preparation, lover of travel, exciting that we're just about there, um, getting back to travel, um, and mother to this little cherub. So I decided that, um, yeah, I thought what I'd do is split this idea of regulate, ready, recover into the athlete and the coach. Um, and I guess this little table is one that I probably spent a bit of time just sort of thinking about it. To be, to be fair, I, I developed it uh, kind of mainly through another sport, actually. Um, I did a, a lot of work with the Australian sailing team, um, and in particular, a couple of, um, Matt Wern, I don't know if he rings a bell, gold medalist from um, the Tokyo Games um, in the laser craft, a, a lot of work with him, and um, this was a kind of a concept that we came up with for athletes to really have I guess, a, like a real sense of purpose when they turned up to training. So we sort of looked at this idea of um, regulating, you know, getting ready and then recovering. Uh, and again, I'm, you know, very conscious that, um, you know, you might look at this in terms of, this is high performance right now. 
you know, this is absolutely high performance. Um, I don't expect community athletes and coaches to go into to necessarily this level, but I think there are still, so I don't, you know, hydration checks and that type of thing. Um, you might not, you might not be doing it at the community level, um, but I think there's bits and pieces that can be taken from here um, and still, um, you know, in regards to how do we train our community athletes um, and look at them in that regard. Um, so yeah, so I'll talk you briefly through these um, and then we'll look at um, my, my sort of coach um, regulate, ready, recover model, if you like. So regulate, um, so really set processes to prepare the body and the mind for training or racing. Um, and again, so for yourself, um, do you race or? Yes. You race as well? Yeah. Okay. So, um, so a condensed period of time during the year. Sure, sure. Um, your, um, even if you haven't necessarily thought of your readiness to compete in this regard, you still have a process that you go through. You have your, you might have some of your own idiosyncrasies, which we all have that start at home. Um, regardless, I don't know if you wear your socks the right way around or, you know, have some of those funny little things, but you've got a process, a general process that you kind of follow. Um, and I guess really that process is no different when you get to an Olympic athlete. It's just that we've probably spent a lot more time talking about it um, and we've made sure that there's science to back up everything that we sort of ask the athletes to do at that level to make sure that they're optimising their performance. At the same time, um, I don't think it ever works. Probably one thing that I, um, I didn't enjoy at waste, and I feel like I'm talk openly about it now, and I don't know how much you guys know about the Western Australian Institute of Sport. It's a, it's a wonderful organisation for, um, for a number of aspects, um, but at the same time, I always had a sense of, um, there was uh, a bit of um, encouragement to tell an athlete what to do. You're the sports scientist, you know what the research is, you tell them what to do. And, now that I run my own business, I get to say that I will never, ever tell an athlete what to do or a coach what to do ever again because I just simply don't think it works. Um, to me, it's all about empowerment. You know, being able to empower an, an athlete or a coach. Obviously, I have, I have some degree of agenda by coming here. I am hoping that you're going to change in some way, shape or form some way, shape or form, what you do from coming out of this. Um, but I also go so far as to say, you've come here for the same reason. You've come here because you're curious and you are innately curious, is there something minuscule that you could take away and change and do something not necessarily better, but different, that might have a different outcome, or maybe a more favorable outcome. So, um, yeah, so anyway, we sort of ended up coming up with uh, this strategy. Um, and I have to say, it really did work very well. So there'd be a, a, a daily wellness... Australia-wide system that you have access to that you can log in and um, upload a lot of your your sleep, um, your recovery, your any injuries, differences in mood, a whole lot of different um, sort of things. And I guess it also serves as a purpose for the athlete to check in with themselves and go, how am I feeling today? Um, hydration tests. Um, so for if an athlete was on camp, or say in the lead up to competitions, often we'd do hydration testing. So I did a huge amount with the swim team, say. Um, you know, often and rowing, you know, going over to Tokyo, there was, um, there was a lot of hydration testing that was done um, because we knew that the conditions were going to be uber hot and humid. And I think I remember watching, um, oh, just forgotten her name, um, a single um, our female. 
Rope rower. Yes. Who won gold? In the single skull. Oh, that's nice. oh not an Aussie. Yeah, the Aussie one. Yeah. Oh, anyway. Anyway. Yes. Oh, for Rio. For Rio. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. That Kim Crow. Yeah. Sorry, Rio. That was Rio. Kim, yeah. Kim Crow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> well, Rio was similar as well, actually. Like, yeah, okay. very hot, very humid, very hazy conditions. Didn't know what we were going to be like. So, anyway, hydration testing there. Um, injury prevention and physical activation. Um, so, lots of, and again, I'm sure you see it with your own rollers. I don't know whether you do it yourself. Um, but in a way, a, um, a warm-up, if you like, before even getting into the boat. Um, so it's kind of a, it's a warm up for the warm up, if you like. And I do firmly believe that um, you know all of our athletes, especially, um, I mean, rowing is a yeah, it's a pretty brutal sport actually. It's a pretty pretty taxing sport as well. Um, and I think there's um, yeah lots of um, ways that we can activate the body and get the body because the body essentially doesn't know what it's about to do. Right, your brain knows what it's about to do. Um, and inadvertently, yes, your brain is starting to already direct blood to the, to the muscles and things, but the muscles themselves don't know what they're about to do until they do it. Um, and so having some way of prepping them for what's to come um, can obviously be beneficial. Um, fueling, um, so fueling the body, um, and if you see that, it's actually put in there twice, um, and that was not a mistake. Um, but we deemed that it was necessary for an athlete to fuel um, at after their injury prevention sort of activation stage. Um, this is plus fueling in the mornings when they've woken up. Um, I still firmly believe that for most active people that you guys might even have at your disposal, I think the majority of people are under fuel. Um, I can almost guarantee that most of the young girls that you work with mm -hmm. under fuel. Um, and I don't know if that's a comp I, conversation that comes up on a regular basis. Um, I had a group, um, I was at a, um, a Curtin University on a Monday night presenting to a group of young, young soccer players and I was taking them through sort of the amount of food almost that I'd expect them to kind of consume with the amount of activity that they do um, and knowing the amount of growth that's happening when, you know, when a, a person is sort of so young as well. And they were just like, no, oh, there's no way I can eat that amount. But um, yeah, I've got, been off topic a little bit already, but um, you know, very, uh, um, yeah, probably. Um, I, I tried to work out a way of making nutrition because often people will say to me, you know, what's the best nutrition that I should eat before a race and after a race, and how much shall I eat, and how do I know if I'm getting enough protein, and what about calcium? And I decided five food groups, something from the five food groups of every meal at breakfast. All five food groups, lunch, all five food groups, dinner, all five food groups. I reckon you're getting everything that you need as a fairly basic way of looking at nutrition. Um, but so often, you know, you look at what an athlete eats for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and there's a vast majority of food groups that are missing. A bowl of cornflakes, there's no problem with a bowl of cornflakes, but it's only two food groups. Um, whereas, you know, I could make these young guys a smoothie that has all five food groups in there. So I think there's a lot um, that we can kind of, yeah, learn just in the nutrition bias there. Um, the regular phase might also include some strength training. Um, and also mind matters. Um, and we put that in there as a way to, <coughs> before you go into your actual training session, um, a number of reasons. Is there anything that's bothering you right now? that might be completely unrelated to your sport. Is it your exam for the coming up? Grandma that's sick in hospital, your dog's about to go in for a, an operation, you, you know, whatever it is that might seem trivial to you and me is a big person for that, a big thing for that person. Um, and if it's a big thing for one of your athletes, then it's a big thing. Um, and, you know, just by taking the time to kind of, um, you know, check in, if there's anything else that's on their mind, because let's face it, we live in a bit of a crazy world um, and everyone's got their own story, right? Everyone's got a lot on their plate. Um, and I think that um, concept of, are you okay? That 
heard about that um, I'm sure you have, but, um, you know, the blue trees and things that you see, see out in the regions and things, just, um, you know, that little, um, taking that moment even to check in um, and see how, how someone's travelled. Um, the readiness stage might then become, okay, actually getting ready to, um, you know, get on the water. So checking the equipment, um, you know, preparing if it's five degrees in the morning down here. Um, I remember, yeah, lots of athletes having to, you know, layer up um, because it just gets very, very cold out there. Um, you know, having a briefing. Um, so again, I'm sure you do that. Um, just a chat around um, what the training session is going to entail, what you sort of expect, how it's going to look, how it's going to feel, etc., etc. Um, having a chat through some individual goals. Obviously, then actually launching um, and getting the session done, and then kind of almost the reverse process, I guess. So um, you know, not trying not to leave any of those little stones unturned. Um, so at the end of the training session, always a good way to check in with the body as well. So was there anything a bit niggly now from that training session that we need to kind of be aware of? Um, having a debrief on the session itself. So again, an athlete's not leaving sort of wondering, did they do the right thing? Did they do a good job? Does it, did it satisfy the coach's knee? All of that. Um, being able to check in with their own um, sort of, um, yeah, individual goals and review. Um, individual cross training, I don't know if any of your athletes do, um, sort of do, I mean, you mentioned your partner does some swimming, your own partner does some additional swimming. Um, do the girls do some sort of running or biking or? Other mixed, forces of mixed and okay. Like, it's got some girls that do like triathletes, and some girls that just do the running stuff. Sure, <laughs> sure. Um, but I think we've, um, I mean, rowing has always been an interesting one because I've been mean, working with um, all the. I did a lot of work with the, the light white boys, so Perry Ward and Ross Brown and then Todd Skipworth and Ben Curran and those guys. And yeah, I mean, definitely it's the physiological requirement is so large and the pressure on the body um, is kind of so great that you usually find rowers supplementing on water training with some sort of other cardiovascular exercise, whether it be running or cycling or, you know, just to fill that engine because it's such a, such a huge engine that's, um, that's involved. Um, daily load check, um, so again for um, uh, you know, high level athletes often looking at you know, number of kilometres, amount of intensity um, and getting a, call it a, a TSS or a training stress score, um, so getting an idea of how that fluctuates from week to week um, to make sure that an athlete's not overtraining. Um, and then of course the recovery piece, which um, probably down at the community level is one piece that doesn't get done sort of so well. Um, and uh, let me rephrase that and say often even up at the top level, um, your top athletes don't always do it so well. Um, after a training session, everyone tends to just want to get home um, and get fed and recovered and things. But um, yeah, definitely by taking that extra bit of time to really wind the body down from the training session that it's just done um, can be very, very beneficial for a number of reasons. Um, done a lot of work with water polo players in the past, and they're renowned for um, you know not tr not getting pool space to train until kind of eight or nine o'clock at night. So by the time they finish the training session, they're getting home at 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, and then they start training at five thirty the next morning. Um, so obviously, there's a, a desire need to get to bed as fast as possible. Yet still, I always encourage them to do a proper cool down because better to spend 20 minutes winding the body down after training than getting home and still being buzzing from a game or a competition and not being able to sleep for a couple of hours. So anyway, so that's kind of the, um, the athlete um, regulate, ready, recover. Uh, and then I... It's actually a bit similar regulate, ready, recover for students, um, just that university club, you know, all growers, also the students at the university. Right. Do you have a similar kind of uh, bit of wellness check or something? I, I reckon we could revamp this to suit that. Yeah, it, it seems applicable. I mean, I'm going to tell you, you might not be training, but you're going to try to get rid of the 
parts of mm -hmm. especially the data order is changing how do I show you my patterns um, and then the, the realization that say five in the end is it seems to be a lot of crossover. Yeah, oh, definitely, and that's why, I mean, look, I, I run um, sessions to schools exactly on that, taking the principles of sports science into how you prepare for exams. It's no different. It's absolutely no different. Yet the number of, um, you know, I mean, potential students at schools that aren't active and, um, you know, think, look, I usually find I think it's all about the high performance mindset. And, and I guess you, you've hit the nail on the head because my goal is to, I guess, try and elicit that high performance mindset, not a high performer. I, I mean, I did my years with Olympic and Paralympic and it was wonderful and amazing and I wouldn't change it for the world, but that doesn't float my boat so much anymore. What floats my boat now is developing, helping anyone to have that high performance mindset. Um, and yeah, just by taking, and I don't think we do a very good job exactly that, preparing our students for an exam. We don't teach them how to study, for starters. We don't teach them anything about memory retention, but I can tell you right now, staying up till two o'clock in the morning, trying to memorize notes, it doesn't work. Physically, I mean, categorically, scientifically, it does not work. The body cannot retain that information. And most of those you know, kids will say they turn up at the exam exhausted and um, can't remember anything that they learned. Um, and of course, it's the same thing as preparing for an Olympic Games. Right? You don't start the night before. You know, it's, it's a four year build up um, to this. So absolutely, I think there's, this could be revamped for um, going into an exam. Absolutely. And especially things like the mind matters, being able to regulate your emotions. Um, you know, we, we ask an athlete to regu regulate their emotions on the start line. Not to say that you, you, you don't get anxious. There's, you know, anxiety brings all sorts of um, wonderful primers, if you like, to the body to get it ready for, um, you know, essentially a fight or flight response, which in a way is all a row of race is. It's a, it's a flight or fight response. Um, <laughs> You know, our bodies aren't, if we go back to, I look, I love going back to caveman day, you know, the actual reason, you know, because it wasn't that long ago. I mean, it was a long time ago, but not that long ago, really. Um, and yes, we, we're doing all this, um, you know, just the fact that we've got light now um, that is available 24-7, you know, not that long ago. When the sun went down, we went to bed because you couldn't see it weren't designed to see the dark. We shouldn't be working right now. It's, our bodies are still fighting that, like still fighting that. Um, I've done a bit of work with miners on mine sites and trying to, like, can I mean, hectic. 12 hour shifts from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. for two weeks straight. And just, uh, yeah, it's, it's just unheard of to try and force the body to change into something like that. Um, it's crazy, but so sorry. Yes, long answer. Going to get me diverted on all sorts of parts here. Um, yes, I'd love to. Um, email me after and yeah. tell me: is it for a school student? Is it for a community roller? And we'll read that this. And um, yeah, we used to have like a little like we we printed them color in color um, and just printed them like yeah, we laminated them out. Um, and it'd just be something that, are, you know, sailor, sailors would have in their training bags and literally that's what we, that was an expectation, I guess, but we, it was always framed in such a way that this is going to benefit you. So it was never, I'm going to tell you, you must refer to this checklist. I told you, that doesn't work. Um, but, you know, over time, building up that relationship that they will want to um, and, you know, literally go through that checklist and, um, yeah, makes, I think it, um, especially in terms of them being able to, you know, and, and same for an exam, like leave the exam behind then. Once, because I, you know, you talk to Horst, I'm sure I did it myself at some point, beat yourself up for days over, you know, knowing that you made a mistake in an exam or, or whatever it is, but, you know, at some point being able to downregulate and just, um, you know, it's done, it's done. So, so yes. 
I'd love to print this out and put it on the get up board but mm -hmm. so people walk past and see it. No problem. It's yours. It's yours. Yeah. yeah. I was thinking that novice rowers because absolutely got a group that is their first year of rowing and I know they're probably thinking about technique and race plans and things like that. You know, I, like I mentioned, I mean, well, for masters, I, I do. I've got a specific presentation for masters athletes, which I just love because, again, like we can't. The masters athlete isn't. It, you're a different athlete. You're not 20 years old. Sorry, um, but you're yeah, not 20 years old. Just having something like that, just to, um, you know, maybe simplified version. Yeah, so totally. Over totally. Time, like, And I think it is that, right? It's just, um, it's not an expectation that they're going to, they're not striving for the, look, for me, what I've got to get out of my head, and this is why I love talking to you guys, I really do, because my head is all geared towards high performance and the Olympic Games. That's, it's, it's kind of all I know in a way, and I'm just loving this journey of coming back to grassroots, actually. And I mean, seriously, you buoyed me up hearing you telling me a 90 year old who's still still rowing, 80 or 90 or 90 year old still rowing, like, ah, that's made my night. <laughs> so, um, yes, absolutely, you guys can get, we can get this, get this to you for easy. So, no problem. Um, but then it does take me to, because then I was like, right, so how do we revamp this for the coach themselves? So I had a look at, you know, what really are the core responsibilities of a coach? Because as I said, I can't help that um, sometimes I think that coaches might feel this sort of, um, you know, sense of, um, I don't know, somehow needing to physiologically change an athlete within a single training session. Um, so that they, you know, every time they come back to you, they're a, they're a stronger, beast or they're a, you know they're, they're taller or they're more technically proficient or you know I think in a way all of those things delve into minor insignificance compared to some of these type of um, practices and principles um, and you'll be pleased to know so we'll go, we'll go through each of them um, but then I've got a little exercise um, for you guys uh, to do so core responsibility, underlying knowledge and professional, uh, interpersonal and intrapersonal skills, such as names create quality sport experiences for athletes. And that's what it is as well, right? It's an experience. Like what is, I mean, it's always interesting to ask, why do you do what you do? Why do you do what you do? Have you thought about it? Game enough to share any with them? Well, enjoy them first and probably the community for sure. Well, yeah, absolutely. And just, um, game skills, I suppose. Yeah. Is it small? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, 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 that's great. That's great. Um, what about yourself? Uh, uh, Kathy, Isaac. A wire and row. Uh, scratch is a bit of an itch, like competitive itch. Okay, yep. I like getting faster, trying to beat you know, my peers. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, I have a lot of friends that are around the club that row. So. And you'll want to coach? Um, I don't know, I, I guess I just looked up to a lot of coaches when I was younger. Okay. And I had that, it was a, uh, that's a big positive influence, so I thought. It's great, but it's also, I guess it's um, warming in a way to know that hopefully then that means that you had a positive experience, <clears throat> or at least you've had a, a, either a series of positive experiences or at least, you know, enough positivity to then want to, yeah. not necessarily pay it back, but at least, but well, yeah. a little bit of that it's, continue. It's also like a bit of a fun challenge sometimes, like trying to, you know, it comes with its own difficulties that I never really anticipated. You chose like, girls yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You may as well have aliens in the boat in front of you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, 
Yeah, so no, that's that's awesome. Um, what about yourself? The, the why? Yeah, uh, I'm certainly an unusual one. I don't get a chance to really very much anymore. I'm sort of administering the club. So, um, yeah, why am I here? I think, uh, as I was going through the club, you know, I always had to help out with things. And did then, you row yourself? That? I did. Okay. Yeah, so I rowed for uh, six, seven years. Yep. So, uh, and then I kind of transitioned into the administrative role um, after dabbling my feet in coaching. Um, I think, I, I guess I just saw a lot of people give their time to the club ahead of me. Sure. And then I started to do a little bit of work what they were doing, realised the impact they were having on the people by going. And then accidentally got sucked uh, to the top of it. Um, ah, and yes. I think, Impact, that's a good word. Yeah, I, yeah. I kind of resonate with what you said earlier about sort of needing to give back. I realized that there were people before me who enabled my role and you know, see it in my view to enable the next group. Sure. And I'll move on, part of that group will take my job. And so it's sort of a uh, cycle or a spiral forward in a way. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you're making me think about it's a big word, but that word legacy, um, you know, of wanting to kind of leave a, not that any of us here are ready to depart this earth, but still like to leave, you know, some sort of a, a legacy behind. Um, and I guess that to some degree that inspires us to kind of do what we do. And to some extent not um, uh, an achievable legacy for the next person too. So you totally. kind of kind of train the next group to see the real the thing you do is achievable and that something that they want to do rather than someone who's been in the club for hundred years and no one ever built their shoes because they've done it all and something that's that person will eventually leave. Although after hundred years probably through death and mm -hmm. um, and there's nothing left for that to leave before learn. So Yeah, totally. Um, tours of duty. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. There was um um I've obviously been um with great excitement that Australia will be hosting um, an Olympic Games in 10 years' time. Um, and it does, whilst it does seem, seem like a, a very long way away, it's um, it, like infrastructure, all of those things are already well and truly being thought of and planned and contracted and, and all the rest of it. And um, I don't know if you guys have seen, but uh, Queensland, and now it is going to be a bit of a funny one because it's going to become the Queensland Olympics here very quickly. Um, we're going to have to be careful of that. But anyway, um, Queensland A have a program called You for 32, uh, which is kind of a, a talent identification program to kind of try and find the next Australian Olympian from literally Queensland's back garden. Um, and um, so literally they're trying to cover the whole state. Um, and I got in touch with the people that were running it, sort of begged them and said, there is an amazing opportunity here to get educational resources out to your entire, you know, network, your entire region of Queensland. Thousands and thousands of people could benefit from little bits of information around hydration and recovery and travel stress and all, all these types of things. You know, so I was like, please, let me write you some content anyway. It's a discussion that's happening. But um, yeah, I think that, um, that sort of, so even with the Olympic Games coming to town, it's so much more, yes, there are going to be world records and there's going to be gold medals in our back garden, it's going to be amazing, but there's so much more about bringing Olympic Games to a country, you know, actually offers. Wasn't going to forget yourself, what's uh, your, your why? Yeah. First of all, I took the medal. I think I'm still learning now about rubbishing, which was taken me 40 years to Of course, learn. of course. So I'm sort of thinking, well, if I can pass on that information that I know now to the other folks, that will help them and girls, it will sort of, it makes it that much easier to learn and think about what you're going to do about growing well. And I sort of wanted to wait 40 years to find out what you're supposed to do, you know what I mean? Yes, but 40 years ago, were you ready? To take, you know what I mean? I can't help but think. Oh, there's certain technique things I think would have been. Sure, they might have been handy. Um, and then, like when we rode, like the middle of summer, we no one had water for We rode the curtain, and it turned around like that. Really? Right. And never had water for And then, what 
Så blir det veldig bra til å prate i stå. Ja, vi gjør det. Så kan han ha jo sin enda øyne. Og at det er større, jeg kan si. Det er større ting som ikke... Ja. Det er flommig for å svære på skolen. Ja. Ja, det er ikke noe mer for det. Ja, men jeg vet at det er
Sorry, Gavin De Becker. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's exactly who it is, Gavin De Becker. Um, so creating positive and inclusive sport environments. Um, again, I think there's um, you know diversity and inclusion are you know they've been you know very you know huge topics kind of at the moment. Um, hopefully, they'll continue to be huge topics for a long time to come as well. So how do we go about creating these um, you know positive and inclusive sport environments? Um, conduct practices and prepare for competition. So that is, I mean, that is the essence of what you do as a coach, physiologically and, you know, building your athlete to be a stronger version, more technically sound, but it's one point among seven, right? It's, it's you know, it's not the be all and end all of coaching. Um, and striving for continuous improvement, which I guess is something that does um, sort of excite me. I remember, um, you know, I remember talking to someone once who um, was able to look me in the eye and tell me that they deemed that they were as good as they could possibly be and had no want to be any better. No want whatsoever to be any better. Um, and it was a, yeah, it was a terrifying moment for me to think that someone could kind of, I couldn't work out whether it was just was I amazed that this person was so incredibly confident in themselves that they were already such an amazing person that they didn't need to be any better? Um, or actually, you know, is there always the opportunity for growth inside all of us to be, not, I don't know if better is the right word, but, you know, be able to influence more greatly or, you know, be, be different um, in some way, do things differently to get a slightly different so then I kind of thought, um, what if we took those sort of values and put them into uh, this process of regulating, ready and recover? So those uh, exact seven points, but around, um, you know, in this, um, so having a set of vision and goals and standards for a program, for me, I guess, is, you know, one of those big pictures. So that was kind of like a regulate piece. Um, Engaging and supporting ethical practices again, I think was um, you, you know is a piece that and we're going to have a look at these um, each of them in a little bit more detail. Um, but being able to teach ethical behaviour, I mean, what is what is ethical behaviour? Is it a um, you know yes, there are we are governed by a set of laws. Um, your clubs might be governed by a set of rules as well, but there are also unwritten values and um, ethics that we uphold in society as what we deem are sort of acceptable and ones we deem are not acceptable. Um, um, and then the readiness piece, so the actual um, coaching practices, so the plans, the teaching, the assessing um, to, um, you know, prepare athletes, your athletes for competition. Um, and then the recovery piece. Um, so building um, environments, developing a safe sport environment and creating positive and inclusive sport environments. So I guess being able to, um, yeah, just being able to sit back, look at, you know, taking that time to sort of um, look at the plan that you've had in place, look at the training session, look at how the club's moving forward, um, look at how you and, you and your, your training partner Kind of have worked together and does that sort of um you know has there been relationships that have been built if there has been that's a tick regardless of whether you performed well or not in the session if you built a relationship in an hour's rowing practice to me that's a tick you know that's a win um, if the environment was a safe environment if people have felt physically and psychologically safe in their environment. Again, regardless of what sort of, um, you know, how many calories they burned or steps they took or, you know, force Newtons they were able to execute, developing a safe, in, having a safe environment. If you can look back in the training session and you get all your girls home safe in one piece, that's a tick as well. Um, and, um, and creating that positive and inclusive environment. 
So again, if um, you know the enjoyment piece as well, and I think that's such a valuable one. So I'm grateful that you said that sort of first up. Um, you know, most of your it's it's what you hope everyone. It's the it's the very it's the it's the tiniest amount you should get back in a way um, is is simply being able to enjoy enjoy what you do. So I guess what I was hoping we could do, and whether we want to do it, um, maybe you guys just want to do it in one group, is to um, go through each of these and let's just kind of break this down. So what does this look like for you guys? Um, so do we want to maybe um, congregate around one table? We can, um, we can either bring them together, I don't know how you want to film this, but... <laughs>